Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about uh, specifically the, the different God models. Uh, this is something I've covered in the past multiple times, I believe, in previous videos in my channel. But uh, since I'm doing this more as a commentary on the my conversation with David, uh, I'll just redo this as a <clears throat> as a short independent video. All right, so these these are the four. Um, common God models in, in Christianity. So we have classical theism, which is more or less the historical position. There's always been people that have disagreed with it, but um, it represents uh, what most Christians believed over the millennia, and it has influenced most of Christian theology. <clears throat> uh, now, on the opposite extreme, we have process theism, which uh, kind of negates, it, it's more or less a logical opposite of classical theism. So whereas in classical theism, God is very static, he's unchanging, basically, he's perfect as he is, and he doesn't need to do anything else, nothing affects him, he doesn't change, God, God has always been and will always be the same and all these things. Uh, and and process theism is, is the exact opposite of that, where it says, no, God is always changing, God is always improving, getting better, evolving over time, and so on. Um, so these are the two extremes, and then you have in-between positions where neoclassical theism, um, it, it, it rejects some of the, the classical attributes of God, but still maintains uh, some of the other traditional attributes like omniscience, omnipotence, uh, foreknowledge, and things like that, while open theism is almost the same, except that they reject foreknowledge as well. Now, open theists uh, tend to be very adamant that they're not process theists. So if you follow the open the open theism, theism's literature, they try to differentiate themselves from the process theologians. Um, so they reject this idea that God is progressing or evolving over time and so on. But uh, they do reject the concept of foreknowledge. So these are the available models. Oh, the, the only other thing I want to say about this is that the, the label neoclassical theism is not a label I'm, I'm happy with because uh, I think the model needs to, to stand alone as opposed to just appearing as some kind of minor adaptation of the classical theism model. Uh, but this is what uh, it seems that people in academia are working with at this moment in time. I'm hoping the label will change to something better because all the other ones have their own labels that are not um, sort of reactionary to the, the classical model. Okay, so these are the models. And what people try to do usually is debate the models on philosophical grounds. And what I've tried to say is that we are not able to resolve that question on philosophical grounds and we're gonna keep debating it um, for, you know, as long as history should last. Uh, but instead, we should treat the models as equals, as in, you know, theoretically, all the models are valid, and then look to see which ones fit better with scripture. And again, we're going to run into issues about scriptural interpretation, but we should say that at least some of these can be dismissed. So I, I think uh, classical theism, at least... And, and I would say process theism as well, some might disagree. I think those two can, uh, it, it seems that the, the Bible's pretty straightforward on those two, that they, they're not really a good fit for scripture. While neoclassical theism and open theism, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a bit harder to tell. Now, I would argue that if a person was unbiased and they just read the scripture, uh, and, and and basically we're open to both possibilities that they would probably lean towards neoclassical theism by the time they're done. Obviously, an open theist would disagree. Really, the key question I have is, is a person approaching the question with a philosophical bias or not? If they're open to both possibilities and then they, they read the Bible and they arrive on one side or the other, there's not much more I can do over that except to say that um, biases tend to kind of die hard. So if somebody does have a, a, a sort of um, philosophical bias in one direction, as much as, as hard as they try to to um, eliminate that bias, is not always easy to do. So what tends to happen with biases is that they kind of 
go away over generations because as people die off and new generations of scholars come on the scene, they don't they don't have the same philosophical attachments. And then it's easier for people to to look at a scripture and say, well, no, I think uh, it's fairly fairly obvious that the scripture leans more in this direction. So if people are, are open to both possibilities equally, probably over several generations, we're going to see the majority of people move one way or the other. While at, at this point in time, we might have debates about which one is more, more likely in agreement with scripture. Uh, I think classical theism, if a person really is open to both possibilities or to, to the several possibilities, I think it should be fairly obvious that there's a lot of a lot of reinterpretation that is needed to harmonize scriptural classical theism. I mean, like you could you could go probably to to massive sections of the Old Testament and have to take stories there and say like, no, this didn't really happen. This is more of a allegory, you know. And that's in fact what a lot of classical theists do. So it's it's hard to allegorize so much of scripture on the one hand and at the same time claim that it's 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 the view that the bible promotes but the the bigger problem we have is that people don't come at this question uh without bias without philosophical bias for whatever reasons um obviously classical theists ha have a, a deep, deep commitment to our aristotelian logic here aristotelian philosophy and as far as they're concerned, that's the only way to think about things. And, and because of that, they're, they're kind of stuck there. Uh, I've argued that philosophy cannot, the, the tools of philosophy are not capable of giving us that, that level of uh, confidence regarding any, any one of these models. And so the whole uh, approach is mistaken. Uh, when it comes to open theism, since, since I, I was talking about this with David, the argument of open theists is that if you want to allow for free will and if you want to allow for people to make their own choices, then foreknowledge shouldn't be possible because for, foreknowledge would mean that uh, somehow people are kind of forced into a certain pathway because God already knows what they're going to do. So obviously because God cannot be wrong, when, when they get to that point in their life, they're going to do what God knows they're going to do. Now, People on the other side of the argument, and let's just be clear, this is not a new debate. It's been around for 2000 years. People have thought about this at length. And, you know, the majority of Christians are actually on, on this on the side of foreknowledge, if you look at it historically. And the way they've thought about it is to say, like, no, it's, the meaning of foreknowledge is not that it's something that God sets up, which creates sort of like a... a a pathway that the person cannot help but, but walk through. The meaning of foreknowledge is just that God knows ahead of time what that individual is going to do in the future based on their own free will. And of course, somebody will say, well, how is God going to know that ahead of time? It's impossible for God to know things ahead of time if it hasn't happened. And all I can say to that is, I have no idea what it's possible and what is not possible for God to do. I'm, I'm uh, uh, agnostic when it comes to uh, pontificating about God's capabilities. You know, I, I don't know if, if God can do this or God cannot do that or whatever. That's that's outside my scope. I'm just saying, let's take these models and let's see which one we're going to lean on if we if we just see what Scripture has to say. Um, as long as we come to Scripture with a previous opinion about what has to be the case, we're very likely going to see that in scripture. If we could come to scripture with a with just agnostic about which of the possibilities is correct, then it's possible that over time, more and more people are going to are going to be convinced that one model is better than the other. So, that's where things are at. <clears throat> now, as far as Adventism, uh, Adventism has been on the neo neoclassical track pretty much its entire history. Yes, we have a a, a few popular open theists among us, but we have a few popular of everything among us. I mean, I don't think there's there's a single belief in Christianity or outside of Christianity that some Adventist doesn't have somewhere within within the denomination. So, you know, just because uh, this one dude, you know, is a classical theist and might be respected in some circles, doesn't, it's not a reason for us to say it has anything to do with Adventism as a whole.
I mean, historically, we've, we've been in this particular position and it's a legitimate position. We're not the only ones holding it. Th this models exist. They've existed outside. They, all four of them existed outside of Avidism long before we came around. Um, they've been around for 2000 years, except process theism is kind of a more recent thing. But I mean, the concept of it has been around still. Um, so we're not doing anything new. These models exist. Again, one of the critiques of, of philosophy is that we don't have the capacity to differentiate between these things on reason alone. So the best we can do is just figure out which one seems to line up with scripture best. And whatever issues we might bring up regarding interpretation and all that, in the end, like I said in the pre in the in my conversation with David, either it's impossible to tell, or over time, as more and more people remove their biases and come to scripture op open mindedly, over time, more and more people are going to lean in one direction or another, because uh, either the biblical data, however people might not like that expression, is all over the place or it's not. So. Yeah, that's the situation. Anyway, um, I think in terms of Adventism, Adventism is more or less located somewhere already, or it has been historically. There's always been people that disagree with, with various aspects of Adventist theology. That doesn't mean we have to keep interrupting what we're doing to address all this stuff. I mean, if this was some, some off-the-wall idea, if neoclassical theism was some off-the-wall idea, we might say, well, we need to revisit that. But given that probably 95% of all Christians that ever lived are going to agree with that more than with, with the other options. Uh, I don't think we need to uh, stop what we're doing because some people might disagree with it for whatever reason. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. Um, and uh, I'm not sure much more can be said about these models. And uh, the, the, the only other point I guess I should say to this is that um, whatever we pick here, these are our macro hermeneutical elements. In other words, whatever we decide here affects how we read pretty much everything else in scripture. So that's why we're, we're having issues with, with historicism because if we're going to go with open theism, historicism is not going to work very well. If we're going to go with neoclassical theism, the historicism actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, these, these elements need to be addressed at the very beginning of our theological process, and it's going to affect what we do with everything else.